Okay, well, uh, good afternoon, I guess it is. It would be a good morning. Um, so we had lots of technical difficulties yesterday with our service. So you catch me in my Monday morning attire. Uh, and so we found out that the service did not record yesterday. And I want to be able to provide those who are utilizing the online platform an opportunity to see the sermon. Uh, I apologize that you won't be able to worship along in song, um, but I want to bring you the message. Um, so I'm going to kind of jump in, get right to it. I'm here in the consistory room, um, and I pray that this, this would be a blessing for you all. Uh, as I always pray, uh, Lord, what is your word for your people. Uh, and as I mentioned this yesterday, recently when I was at the, the marriage night here at the church, I saw a comedian, he was talking about, uh, you know, at one point in his life, he, uh, as a comedian, uh, had this thought of, how do I get people to laugh? Um, and when he became a Christian, he had a per perspective change. So instead of it being about him and, and how can I make people laugh, uh, it, it really became more about the audience and, you know, how can I give these people an opportunity to laugh? And in my own pastoring, uh, you know, that was kind of a perspective change because when you first start preaching, you have this thought of, you know, I really just want people to think well of me. I, think, I, I want them to think that I, I did a good job. And so hearing, hey, you did a good job. I mean, we, we really liked what you said and things like that. Um, that's really where uh, my immature thoughts uh, have went often. And instead, I really like having the mindset of, uh, you know, I really want to give the people in the body of Christ an opportunity to respond to God's word, not to, not to like what I say, or to think that I did a good job. Obviously, I do want to do a good job uh, with what God has given me. I want to be a good steward of those things. Um, but more than that, if I'm bringing God's word to God's people, I want to give God's people an opportunity to respond to his word. So uh, as we pray this prayer, I pray that God would um, would open, would, would do the things that we're praying. So uh, bow your head or, or, or keep your eyes open, um, but either way, hear this prayer and ask this for yourself. Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me today? Open my eyes to see you, <clears throat> my ears to hear you, my heart to receive you, and my will to obey you. And we ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Um, the first verse that I'm going to read today is the memory verse from chapter 2 of the Discipleship Essentials book. Uh, and if you're going through this, uh, this book with us, um, this will make more sense. But it's the foundation of what today's message will be over also. So the memory verse this week was Luke 9, 23 and 24. Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. Now we're going to move to a story in Luke uh, about Jesus calling his disciples. This is Luke chapter 5, uh, verses 1 through 11. So listen as I read this uh, section of scripture here. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. 
So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. <clears throat> when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken, and so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. So as we continue on, this is week two of our series in Discipleship Essentials. Today uh, we are tackling the question, or this week we're tackling the question, what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? Uh, this, for all of us, should be a very personal question. When we ask ourselves, what does that look like for my life to actually not just say that I'm a Christian, but to actually be a disciple? Um, and uh, yeah, that's what we're going to explore today. Um, before I jump into the message, um, I really felt like it was heavy on my heart this week that I wanted to address uh, some of the feedback that I've gotten, but also some of the issues that we're struggling with as a church and, and just as a society in general. Uh, as a pastor, I certainly struggle with this tension as to how much of the circumstances of society do I allow to have an impact on the messages that I'm bringing. And at the same time, I certainly don't want to just stick my head in the sand and ignore everything that's going on around us. So uh, there are some things that I, I wanted to talk about. And so the first thing that I want to talk about is it really is an issue and it's, uh, it's the attitude uh, that I'm seeing. Uh, you know, I've had it said to me this past week, you know, if, if we want to make disciples, we have to be disciples. And I absolutely agree with that. And that's exactly why we're going through this series. But I really feel like as a church and as a society, uh, we are sincerely falling short when it comes to loving one another well. Um, and a huge, huge part of this divide, it's no secret, is over COVID and wearing masks. Uh, <clears throat> and I can honestly say that over these issues that seem in some ways so trivial, obviously, at the heart of these are some very um, deep-seated uh, opinions and uh, convictions where people feel like that they are trying to serve Jesus the best that they can and, and feel very strongly about that. Um, but I've never seen the church so divided as I have right now. Literally, in my own life, I've never seen such a division. Um, and guys, I just want you all to know that, that we literally, we have elders, we have deacons, and we have staff, and, and others who are in leadership positions that are feeling so much pressure from all the sides uh, of, of, of the argument, basically. And I've heard numerous times this week, uh, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place. Uh, I don't feel like I can do anything right. Uh, no matter what I do, I can't make anyone happy. Uh, you know what? I, I don't need this. Uh, I feel like I might as well just quit. It would be better for me just to quit. Uh, I really don't need this in my life. And so um, <clears throat> I'm not absolutely not telling people uh, to stop sharing their feelings and opinions. And, and honestly, there have been quite a few of you who have shared uh, your feelings or your opinions and have done so in a very loving and a very gracious way. And I, and I so appreciate that. But what I am asking for is for the body of Christ uh, to show some grace towards others. Uh, we need to be showing the love of Jesus. Uh, and if you don't agree with someone else's stance on an issue, um, belittling, shaming, uh, questioning someone's Christianity, um, these are absolutely in my opinion, I mean, well, you know, I think scripturally speaking, these are absolutely not an appropriate way of handling a disagreement in a godly way. 
Um, so please, you know, in regards to these issues, be considerate of those who are in leadership roles, and, and not even those who are in leadership roles. Uh, pray for them, uh, but also anyone else who might share a differing opinion. Um, let's make sure that we're, we're in some relationship with these people and um, not just lobbing grenades back and forth at one another. <clears throat> the second thing I want to address is some of the feedback that I've received from some of you in, in regards to the teachings about making disciples. And really that this idea in order to be a disciple that we have to sell everything, move to Africa, um, otherwise we're really not doing, doing it right from our perspective or something like that. And, and I just want to say that's absolutely not what we're teaching. Um, I mean, if you want to sell everything um, and go to a third world country and tell others about the gospel of Jesus Christ, by all means, I mean, I would love for you to do something like that. Um, but really what I want to warn you guys about uh, in my message is, is um, two extremes that Satan wants to uh, whisper, two lies that are extremes that Satan wants to draw us towards. Um, and, the, and the first lie is that you're okay. Uh, this is complacency, and Satan loves complacency. Um, he wants us to come to a place in our walk where we, uh, we just feel like we're Christian enough. Christian enough. Uh, you know, we're saved. We know enough. We've done enough. Hey, I go to church. It's good enough. Um, and that complacency is where Satan uh, wants us to be at one extreme. And then the other lie he likes to tell us is it'll never be enough. You know, I, I come to church. I go to Bible study. I tithe. I go on mission trips. I donate my time to the poor. Uh, I did sell my house. I did move to Africa. I, and it never, it's, an, it's never enough. Um, and the problem with both of these, ultimately, is that they focus on you. Um, when we're so focused on ourself, we easily get caught up in the lies that Satan is trying to whisper in our ears. Um, so first of all, with the first lie, um, you're not okay. You're a sinner. Um, and in regards to this, God wants us to be content, but he doesn't want us to be complacent. And so the lie that Satan wants us to believe, that you're okay, he wants us to be complacent. And a lady by the name of Carla Gasser, she does a great job of explaining the difference. Uh, you know, because I was trying to wrestle in my mind, what, what, what is the difference between contentment and complacency? And she says this, <clears throat> contentment is wisely accepting the reality of situations you cannot change without complaint or resentment. So basically, contentment is, uh, you know, you accept the things that you can't change. And you don't complain, you don't resent God for it. Okay, Lord. Complacency is smugly refusing to accept responsibility for things over which you have some control. Uh, <clears throat> a content person says, I will accept what God has given me and make the most of it. Circumstances uh, don't control or steal your joy when you're, com when you're content. But a complacent person cries, this is good enough because I cannot do anything to make it better which in reality, there may be some things that you could do to make it better. So when you boil it all down, uh, a, a content person is someone who accepts things that are out of their control, and a complacent person is someone who's not willing to accept the responsibility to do things, to do something about uh, something that's within their control. Uh, <clears throat> and so in regards to the second lie, uh, about it, it'll, it'll never be enough. Well, that's true. It will never be enough. Um, because if we could do enough to earn our salvation, then Jesus wouldn't have had to die to save us. And that's why the focus has to get off of us and onto Him and onto His payment for what He's done. And the circumstances we can't control, he wants us to be willing to accept. And those things that he has placed before us that we can control, 
he calls us to do something about those things. So guys, we're, we're living in a time like never before. And, and I don't know if it's the end, uh, but we're all going to die. We're all going to die someday, and we have to be ready. Listen, I want to grow old. I want to... I want, to, I want to be an old husband and love my wife greatly until the end. I want to be a father who's in my old age and watch my kids grow and have grandkids and all these things. Um, but the reality is, is that if I die, that's okay. It's okay if, if I go because God has got my family. And if it's his plan for me to go sooner than later, then I'm okay with that. Because genuinely, in my heart of hearts, I know that the hope that I have for eternal life isn't some fantasy. This is the reality of where I'm going. And I trust God that he is going to do what he sees uh, as best. Um, and we all have to be ready. Um, guys, I, I, I want us to... I want to remind us that, that people's houses are on fire and there's an urgency for us to tell them that there's a way out. Um, people are dying, whether it's the end of the world or not, people are dying and going to, to hell literally probably about every second of every day and there's an urgency to tell them that there's a way out. And so who's supposed to tell them? Who is supposed to tell these people that there is a way out and that they don't have to spend eternity separated from God, that, they, that actually that their eternity can be something far more blessed than they could ever uh, imagine? We are. We believers uh, in Jesus Christ, we are the ones he has called to spread the gospel and to tell others about him. And that's exactly why we're doing this series. We want all of you to be disciples. We want all of you to be equipped to share your faith and to help others understand how to grow in their faith. If someone came to you and asked you to disciple them or to mentor them in the faith, would you know what to do? Would you know where to start? Yeah, I mean, you can bring them to church. That's great. That is great. We do need the body of Christ, but we want all of you to be equipped. And I would say, first of all, many of us really don't think a lot about the idea of making disciples, uh, even though it's exactly what Jesus commanded us to do. And secondly, many of us just assume that a person is going to become a good Christian by coming to church or reading enough of their Bible or hanging out with other Christians. And yes, these things are absolutely a part of discipleship but just to hope that people are randomly going to learn what they need to know if they hear enough sermons or go to enough small group or hang out with enough, enough Christians isn't really going to cut it if we genuinely want to help all of you be able to disciple someone else. We really don't know what the church of the future is going to look like but I want to be found faithful that I did all that I could do to prepare all of you to prepare others. The command is not for pastors to go and make disciples. The command is for all of us. Go and make disciples. And yes, I, I understand that we all have different gifts. And know that I, I don't think that we should all be put in a box and come out looking the same. Not everybody who is a disciple of Jesus Christ is going to come out on the other side looking the same or, or should be doing the same thing or, or again, was we all weren't given the same gifts. <clears throat> but the foundation of what we all believe doesn't change. And we have to know 
what we believe and we can't be swayed by the ever-changing world and culture who wants to reinterpret and redefine an unchanging word of God, an unchanging God, an unchanging truth. We have to have an anchor. We have to know what that is, and we have to know how to pass that on to the next generation without it being distorted. Uh, in the scripture that we read at the beginning today, we hear things like, uh, lose your life, and uh, they, they left everything and followed him. And I, I realize these are, are scary words to the flesh. And confusing even at times. What does that mean? But to lose your life, to leave everything and follow him. This is the call of Christ. Where he leads, we follow. What he says, we do. And when he calls, we go. Again, this is not to say that it's never enough. And God is certainly not leading us all in the same direction. But we'll all have to answer to the Lord in the end for what we've done and what we haven't done. And there's no hiding any sort of motivation or lack of doing. God knows. God knows what we've done, haven't done, and why we didn't do or did do what we did or didn't do. We all have a a tendency to want to build up our own kingdoms, to set our own agendas, uh, and, and to do our own things. But if we want to be disciples of Jesus, we have to understand that we're not our own, that we were bought with a price, and that there's a cost to following Jesus. And if we want to be his disciple, he not only tells us that we have to count the cost, but he tells us what the cost is. He tells us what the cost is and the cost to follow Jesus is everything. Jesus explains this to his disciples in Luke chapter 14, beginning at verse 25. Hang with me. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower, won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king, won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. These are some strong words. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a theologian in during, during before World War II and the times of World War II. Uh, he was from Germany, and he certainly had every opportunity to... He was a professor here at a prestigious seminary here in the United States, and he had the opportunity to just stay here and live in safety and protection during World War II, but he felt called that he had to go back to Germany and be with his people, and he didn't make it. He didn't make it alive out of World War II. And here's what he had to say about the call of Christ. Says the cross, he says, the cross is laid on every Christian. The first Christ suffering, which every man must experience, is the call to abandon 
the attachments of this world. It is that dying of the old man which is the result of his encounter with Christ. As we embark upon discipleship, we surrender ourselves to Christ in union with his death. We give over our lives to death. Thus it begins, the cross is not the terrible end to an otherwise God-fearing and happy life, but it meets us at the beginning of our communion with Christ. When Christ calls a man, he bids him, come and die. When Jesus calls us, he says, come and die. Come and lose your life so that you can have eternal life. Guys, God is not calling us to give everything away. Only one time in Scripture do I, do I see where Jesus came to a man and told him to sell everything. The problem wasn't that the guy had stuff. The problem is, is the guy's stuff had him. And so Jesus isn't calling each of us to give everything away. He's calling us to give it all to him. And then if he tells us to give it away, by all means... As I think back through my own story about being a disciple of Jesus Christ, it's a miracle that God walked with me through the process, uh, that he didn't cut me from the team or, or give up on me at some point. But I'm thankful that he has brought amazing and faithful men of God into my life uh, that have taught me uh, not just what being a Christian looks like, but what being a disciple of Jesus looks like. And I'm still learning. I'm still seeing other disciples of Christ live that out, and I'm learning so much from them as well and from so many people here at Alto. Um, but I've literally been mentored by three tremendously amazing men who've laid everything at the foot of the cross to follow Jesus. So one of my mentors, he, he sold his house, uh, sold his business, moved his family from suburban Columbus, Ohio, to the middle of southern Ohio, literally the poorest county in Ohio, uh, in order to start a discipleship ministry uh, to help men get off of drugs and alcohol. He kind of had a cushy life, and he left all that to be a part of this calling uh, that he knew that God was calling him to. He didn't have it all figured out when God called him to this, but, but he went, and over 20 years later, uh, thousands of lives, thousands of men have been through this ministry, and, and, and thousands of lives have been changed. And then the, the multiple thousands of lives of their families and friends have been impacted by the ripple effect of all that went on there. Another of my mentors, he was a successful career counselor. And, and when the company he worked for went under, um, he devoted the rest of his life to mentoring and counseling others to discover their gifts and callings to use for the glory of God in the marketplace. Guys, in the marketplace is where a majority of us spend most of our time, and that is our mission field. Those who the Lord places before us every day, students, employers, employees, customers, whatever it is, uh, co-workers, these are the people that Jesus wants us to be the hands and feet of Christ for. Another mentor of mine, uh, he left the pastorate after 25 years uh, when he knew that God was calling him to, uh, to church planting full-time. And if you know anything about um, church planting in the United States of America, or the history of it a little bit, um, at one point in the Methodist church movement, they literally were averaging two church starts a day. And uh, so this man, who is a mentor of mine, he feels led to be a part of a, a movement uh, where they're literally averaging at least one new church start a day. Uh, and so, uh, he, so much so, he, his license plate says one a day. And that's not uh, a plug for some daily vitamin. This is because this is what he believes God has called him to. 
Um, they haven't reached that yet, but since 2007, um, Vision USA has begun 770 new churches in 95 different regions of the United States and in other countries. That's amazing. 770 new churches in the past 13 years because he's been willing to follow God's calling. You know, I ask myself, why in the world have I been so blessed to have uh, such great men of God in my life to show me what faith looks like? And the only answer I can think of is, is that God wants me to live by faith. And God wants me to show others what it looks like to live by faith. And God wants others that I've shown to live by faith. And God wants them to show others how to live by faith. And so on and so on until Jesus comes back. And guys, none of this was my plan. It wasn't like I was going throughout my life seeking all these mentors. This was, this was God's plan. Uh, the first mentor I had, uh, I literally met because I was a, a drug addict. He had bought this property, and uh, God was using men, him to help men get off drugs. The crazy thing about the story is that uh, he had just started the ministry, and I was literally the first guy, literally, ever to come to the ministry. Bought the property, hired two guys, and here I was showing up on his doorstep on a Sunday night in November in the year of 2000. Uh, no success rate, no history, not even much of a plan. Just, just a guy following the call of Jesus, trying to lead other men to Jesus. My second mentor, he was an older man I went to church with. I was just trying to figure out life, and he was a guy who was willing to walk alongside me that had some gifts that he wanted to use to be a blessing to me. And we met almost every week for about three years, and he just poured into my life, and he was there to listen to me and there to care for me. And when I met Marlena, when, when we were first dating, uh, when we first decided to date, he was the first guy that I wanted to take her to meet. My third mentor, I met uh, waiting tables. I was waiting on him and his wife, and he, and he told me that uh, he was a pastor and that they felt like God was calling them to church planting. And I was like, man, I'm kind of interested in that. I, you know, I gave him my phone number, and they called me, and it turns out that they weren't serial killers, which is a good thing. Um, and again, for some reason, not by my own plan, but God brought me in again on the front end of what they were doing. Um, out of 770 churches that Vision USA has planted, literally, the church that we planted was the first one. Two of these, men's, uh, two of these men, uh, the one who is with doing church planting and started the, the men's ministry, have written books about their faith journey. And the story about how I met them and our journey together is, is, is in both of their books. And... Uh, None of this is because of what I've done, but I'm thinking that God probably knew that there was nobody else dumb enough uh, to go along with people who were just saying, hey, you wanna, you wanna go? And I'm like, okay, where are we going? Uh, and so years later, here we are, and I was a guinea pig, they live and learn, and hopefully some other lives have been changed in the process. Um, but my point is with all three of these, scenarios is to ask this question. What do, what do these three scenarios have in common? And the answer is discipleship. People of God intentionally walking with others to teach them what they've learned and to learn from you and to walk together for the glory of God. I love how our Discipleship Essentials book defines discipleship or, or, or a disciple, um, which is what we're talking about today, being a disciple. It says, a disciple is one who responds in faith and obedience to the gracious call and to follow Jesus Christ. That's the first part of the definition. So that's salvation, somebody who has responded to the call of Jesus paying the price for our sins being born again, saved. 
The second part of that definition is being a disciple is a lifelong process of dying to self while allowing Jesus Christ to come alive in us. And this is the Christian word sanctification, maturing, growing up. So we have born again, that's part of being a disciple, growing up, that's part of being a disciple, working towards maturity, not becoming complacent, hey, I'm born again, there's nothing else I need to do, but being content. Hey, I'm born again, but I'm not quite there. God's doing some things. He's calling me to do some things. So let's do some things. And I'm going to keep walking this out. The Apostle Paul puts it perfectly in Philippians 3, 13 and 14. He says, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. This is a lifelong process. This isn't something here on this earth that we take a hold of. This is something that we press toward until God calls us home. Jesus calls us to, not, to deny ourselves. And he wants us to give up our own wants and our own desires, particularly our sinful fleshly desires, to allow the Holy Spirit to come alive in us. You know, as I've, as I've thought about this, the one thing that I want you guys to grasp is that we literally are the manifestation of the Holy Spirit here on earth now. You know, God came through the prophets, God sent Jesus, and now he has sent his Holy Spirit into believers to be living manifestations of his Spirit here on earth. It's so crazy, literally, to think of that we're not just people who are mimicking or trying to imitate some great teacher long ago. No, God said he has sent his spirit to live in us so that he can manifest his spirit here on earth through us. That's crazy. God lives in us and he wants to manifest his spirit through us. Think about that. That blows my mind. And when we give up our wants, we give up our desires, when we lose our lies for the kingdom of God, we find our life. And we have to rid ourselves of, of the feeble attempts that, that we try over and over again to save ourselves, to somehow experience uh, heaven on earth like we have taken a hold of it rather than pressing towards it. Um, whether it's by, by being good enough, doing enough good deeds, uh, finding the perfect spouse, uh, obtaining a certain status, having enough money, having enough education, having enough power, um, having the perfect house, finding the perfect church. All of these fall short. I think the great Missionary Jim Elliott sums all of this up nicely. He says, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. So what's the application? Two things that I want to talk about today. First of all, do discipleship essentials. So we are trying to take you all on this journey to equip you we're not saying that in order to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, you absolutely have to go through this book and that this is the only way and that this is the only part of discipleship. But we want to equip you guys with the foundations of, of our faith. And not only that, but we want to equip you guys with a way to equip others in, in, in a simple way. Some things that you can pass on to others. And if possible, do this with someone else. I have grown so much 
by walking through this with, with Randy McDaniel here in our church. What a great, great man of God. And he has challenged me in so many ways. Um, and, and we're just growing together. And secondly, uh, let go of what you're holding on to uh, that, that God is asking you to let go of, that you are holding on to, where you're trying to, uh, uh, whatever it is, where you're trying to find life or something that he is calling you to let go of. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for the body of Christ, Lord. And Lord, I know you brought me here today even to re-record this. And I pray that through this recording, it would be a blessing to those who hear. Lord, I pray that we would be your faithful disciples. In Jesus' name, amen.